Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast, celebrating pro and college football history. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast. I am author and oral historian Jackson Michael with you. And on the show today is Chris Willis, who is also an author and oral historian, and he works for NFL Films. Now, guests on the Game Before the Money podcast are almost exclusively former players, coaches, and executives. But I wanted to have Chris Willis on. Like I said, he's an author and oral historian, just like I am. And he has a new book out about Bronco Nagurski called Bronco, the legendary story of the NFL's greatest two-way fullback. And Bronco Nagurski's era is an era a little bit before what I get into most on this program. So it's great to have Chris on for that. And also he had guidance on the book from Tony Nagurski, Bronco Nagurski's son. And I got to meet Tony Nagurski totally by accident a few years ago at the Tucson Festival of Books. I was doing a book signing for the game before the money. And he mentioned that his dad had played for the Chicago Bears way back when. And I said, you mean during Bulldog Turner's time? And he said, well, a little bit before then. And then he told me that he was Bronco Nagurski's son. That was a real surprise and a real treat to meet Tony Nagurski, son of Bronco Nagurski. And really excited that Chris Willis put all the effort into putting this great book together. Let's sit down and chat with Chris Willis. And you've got a new book about Bronco Nagurski out. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that that came out in August. I got cooperation from the family. They sort of approached me um, after my Red Grange book. They were uh, excited to maybe doing that type of project for uh, you know for uh, for Bronco Nagurski, Tony Nagurski, who's the son, uh, who's the eighty year old son of Bronco, <laughs> was excited about trying to preserve his you know his legacy and and his history, and so I was able to do the project with them, interviewed the family, you know, uh, went through their uh, library, their archives. Uh, he had some letters from George Hallis, so it made the, made the book a little bit more interesting and different from any previous projects. So, uh, so that was the one that just came out, like I said, it just came out in August. So we're starting to get that out there to, to the readers and uh, especially the, the football historians and fans uh, that might want to read about one of the truly great early you know, NFL players in Bronco Nagurski. Yeah, you talked about Bronco, you talked about Red Grange, and, you know, those are guys they played really almost 100 years ago. Um, what what would interest current fans about them? What, why is it important to preserve that legacy, do you think? Well, I think for any fan base or any type of growth, I mean, you got sometimes you have to learn where, where the game came from. You know, uh, I mean, I think some sports like you know, boxing and base, especially baseball, maybe do a little better job preserving their history or presenting it, especially in print form. You know, I mean, the thing about football is football is a visual sport. Everybody wants to watch it, <laughs> you know, be at the game or watch it. You know, they love highlights, you know, so it's, it is a little challenge to, to, to inform, you know, fans or younger, you know, younger fans of the history of the game because they'd rather watch it. You know, we don't have a lot of footage of Bronco Nagurski and Red Grange, but, but I think their stories matter. I mean, you know, as big as the sport is today, it's the number one sport, you know, you know, Super Bowl is the number one you know, sporting event. You know, where did the game come from? You know, how did these athletes propel the game when it wasn't very popular, you know, especially in the 20s, 30s, and 40s to what we see today? So so I think that's important, you know, uh, uh, to tell these stories. You know, like I said, it's, it's, as much as everybody knows about Jerry Rice and Joe Montana and Tom Brady, you can watch all their games, you can watch all their highlights, but for some of these early players, you know, where do you find the information? So I think telling these stories, preserving the stories are important to show where the game came from and how it got started because, you know, we're all the benefactors right now in watching it, you know, or, or working or whatever, you know, we love the game and hey, this is how it got started, you know, with these with these pioneers. Yeah, and especially, you know, Bronco Nagurski, one of the bedrocks of the first generation of Chicago Bears. What's a what's a story of his that that really stands out and in, in helping to build the Bears into what they are today? 
Well, Bronco was like, unlike Red, Red was a little more outgoing, had a little more, you know, sort of personality that sort of gravitated to, to sports writers, you know, where Bronco was more low key. He was more shy. So it was really his play on the field that sort of got the attention of, of, of sports writers and fans, especially in Chicago when the Bears, especially in the early 30s when they were at their height of, of Monsters of the Midway and, and, you know, helping win. NFL championships. So, and I think the other thing for, for Bronco that helped was because he was shy, he sort of had this more of this Paul Bunyan esque story or personality, so to speak, where it was more legend, you know, because of his size. You know, he was huge. He was 6'2, you know, 230, 35 pounds. You know, he was just a huge man, especially at that time in the NFL. And he's playing fullback. He wasn't even playing, you know, off at the line, he was playing fullback you know, and linebacker on defense. And so I think it was partly that, you know, where he was this mythical player who just did these great things on the field, you know, like he's a power runner, you know, lead blocker for Red Grange and Baby Feathers, who was the first running back to rush for a thousand yards. And he was a devastating tackler on defense. So I think the combination of his, of his size and sort of mythical, you know, uh, story and personality uh, that led to, to his popularity during the time, especially with Bears fans. Speaking of the legend of Bronco Nagurski, you know, one of his most famous plays, it's, it's interesting because he had so many great um, personal feats, but a lot of times, you know, his his greatest feats were, were helping his teammates and alluding to right now the 1932 NFL championship game, really the, the first NFL championship when he threw the game-winning pass to Red Grange. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that story and that play? I think the one thing that's really important for, for, for Broncos you know, career when you look at it is that he did play in, in some of these really famous games that sort of got the NFL started, especially with championship games. And in 1932, when, when the Bears tied with the Portsmouth Spartans for first place, you know, they decided to play this game in Chicago in December of 1932. And there was a big snowstorm and the game was actually moved indoors into Chicago stadium. They played like on an 80 yard field, really confined. They, they created hash marks for the NFL for the first time. And uh, so it was a low scoring, really a zero zero game in, in, until late in the fourth quarter when the bears had it, you know, near the goal line. And, and they ran a play where it, it was called a, a little P pass where Bronco would kind of, run, you know, like he's going to carry the ball, but then would back up and throw a pass to an end or back, you know, you know, going across the middle. And, and that was the play that scored the only touchdown in that game. You know, Bronco threw it to Red Grange and, and they got a safety later and they won nine to nothing. And that sort of propelled the league, especially NFL owners to say, Hey, we need this type of game at the end of the season. So they ended up splitting the NFL into two divisions and they created the NFL championship game. Uh, which the Bears won the next year, and Bronco threw two touchdowns in that game. Uh, you know, pretty much the same pass. You know, where he would charge the lines. You know, just stop and jump and throw a jump pass, and it was very hard to stop because you know, a lot of times you would you need to respect the run and you needed to tackle. You know, big Bronco, but but like you said, Bronco was unselfish. He would he would pass. He would he would lead block all the time. I mean, if you look at his career stats, I think he only scored like twenty some touchdowns, twenty four touchdowns rushing and. Because a lot of times he's the lead blocker, you know, for Grange or Baby Feathers or, or Carl Plumball, you know, some of the backs that they had. And he didn't care about the touchdowns. He just wanted to win. And, you know, we've just only talked about his offensive feats, you know, but his linebacking yeah. play got him a lot of accolades as well. Yeah, absolutely. I wish we had a little more footage. We only have a handful of games, you know, from, from the 30s. And you could tell he, he's, he's very active. He's, he's, he's always around the ball. He's, he gets all blocks pretty, you know, pretty good. And, you know, he's, and he's a devastating hitter, you know, obviously with two, 235 pounds or whatever, he could bring a load and stuff. So he was very fierce on both sides of the ball at a time when you had to be very good on both sides. You just couldn't be a running back or just be a linebacker. You had to play both ways. Yeah, the roster size was very limited. And, yeah, it was a 60-minute game back then. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the things about that era is, it's so fascinating to see, you know, how, how the league got started. This is how they did it. You know, they would, they would play for, you know, a hundred dollars a game and they would have to play both ways pretty much 60 minutes. And you, you had to be skillful. You know, I remember reading quotes, especially like Sammy Ball saying, 
you know, if you couldn't tackle, then you didn't play, you know, like, or if you couldn't run the ball, you didn't play. Like, it didn't matter what your skill level was or whatever, or, hey, I could catch, but, hey, if you couldn't tackle on defense, then you weren't going to play, you know, just because you could catch or get open. So uh, that was a unique time, especially for the NFL, those 60-minute players going both ways. You mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that, that you had seen some film on Bronco Nagurski. Now, you'd like to chat a little bit about NFL films and, and your role there. You're the head researcher, I, th- I think it's listed as. Uh, yeah, I'm the head archivist uh, is what the title, uh, and, uh, you know, this is my 27th year here. So I run the research library. So I work with the producers on a daily basis. So any project that they get, say they're doing a football life show on Jerry Rice, then they'll come in here. We have a uh, print material, we have books, magazines, programs, you know, all kinds of stuff that they can grab to do research that that's not online or, you know, where they want to shoot it for the show. And then we have our tapes, we have our footage that they need, you know, they want to find and stuff like that. So, uh, so, so that's what I do sort of on a daily basis. Uh, and then I check scripts and, and do, do a lot of other things, you know, to, to, to help out with, with our different shows and, and programming. Now, do you get to watch a lot of the, a lot of the film then, a lot of the game film? Yeah, I mean, we, we have most of it still on film, some of it's on tape, and then some of it's on our, our digitized system that you can just access from your desktop. So um, so there's ways of being able to, yeah, so I've seen, you know, as, as, as much, I guess, as, as an individual can, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, uh, of our library. So uh, over, over, you know, 20, like I said, over 27 years worth. So um, over that time, you know, I mean, we're all football fans. We all love it. You know, we all have our great memories of the game and, and of games we watch. Is there a game that you've been able to see that isn't as well known in football history or a play that when you think of it, it was when you when you saw it, it was like, oh, my goodness. Wow. This that was incredible. Yeah, I, I think for the most part, it is going through the footage you know, uh, uh, mainly the 30s and 40s. We don't have that much of the 20s, but I think it's just me because a lot of these players are just, you know, uh, you read in the newspaper and you read the recaps, the game recaps, or you, you hear in, or you read interview quotes, you know, um, or, or history. But to see players like Bronco Nagurski or Red Grange or Mel Hine or Don Hudson you know, like you can read up on him, like, oh, wow, everybody's telling me he's great. And, he, you know, you know, Don Hudson, you know, runs, you know, pass routes. But to actually see the footage and say, because we know of the modern game. You know, I'm 52 years old, so I've seen Jerry Rice games, all his games. I can, you know, I know how he runs routes and how he catches the ball and how dominant he was. Or somebody like Walter Payton or Emma Smith, like, you've seen them, you know. But some of these players, so I think that's, for me, it's, it's impressive because then it's like, hey, I know Mel Hines great. Lamar Hine made the 100th anniversary team. So what made him great? So you can you can see some of those footage, or, or same thing with Don Hudson, and you can see some of the skill level and some of the techniques that they use. You're like, wow, that's what made him great. Because if you see them compared to some of the other guys on film, you can see the difference. You know, when you watch ones from the 30s and 40s, and you see Don Hudson and Mel Hine on film, you can see why they stood out. They're making a lot of plays. Athletically, they're so much more gifted than some of the other players. And you can see, it's kind of like today. You see Justin Jefferson make a one-hand catch yesterday. It's just amazing. Well, there's not a lot of guys that can make that catch, in, even in the NFL. So for me, it's more being able to see these guys that you typically just read about more than, than be able to watch their footage. Yeah, wow, that just, that just sounds amazing. And yeah, you know, it, it is that film, you know, like when you were talking, I was thinking of Aaron Donald, you know, it's so much, he's so much clearly better than the rest mm-hmm. of his peers. And then to hear about some of these legends that we've read about our whole life, having that same kind of gap between, you know, their skills and the, and the median NFL player. That's great to hear. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And you also talked a little bit about oral history and um, you have a, an oral history book as well called Old Leather. And oral history is really what I'm into as far as NFL history. So I'd kind of like to get your take about, you know, what the importance is of, of oral history and especially with former football players. No, I, I think it's one of, yeah, one of the most important things we, 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 especially as writers or historians, you know, or authors, like is to be able to find, you know, some of these people that, that either lived it, 
you know, a play, you know, and and to get their viewpoints and their, you know, their experiences. I mean, I, I think that's, you know, I, I just, you know, for me, you know, I love the early years. Uh, obviously, there's not as many <laughs> players around from, from, from those years, so, so it's a little bit limited, you know. Uh, you know, that's why I, when I read oral history books, I just like three of my favorite books are oral history books. Pro Football Rag Days by Bob Curran, you know, The Game That Was by Myron Cope, and then the, the game they played by Richard Whittingham, which came out in 1984. Like, and he was able to interview like Don Hudson and Red Grange uh, and Wellington Merritt. Like those those stories, you know, once somebody passes away, you know, they go away. You know, uh, you know, some of my writing projects I've gone and interviewed, you know, family members, and that's the next best thing. You know, you do Bronco Nagurski, and I can interview the son, but it just makes so much worth, you know you know, more value and historical context when you can interview somebody. So, um, so interviews are, are always key in any project or any type of thing. You know, like I love using quotes, you know, I can write it and, and explain it, but if somebody can say it, you know, who lived it or, or were there or played in the specific game, you know, we're talking about the indoor game in 1932. I just love to hear, even if it's a small quote to tell, you know what, the, the place smelled because there, you know, it was played indoors and there was a circus there the week before. Like, it doesn't have to be some great quote or anything, but if somebody's there and they can tell you, you know, how they felt or what they experienced, you know, those, those go a long way in learning, you know, uh, about the experience, especially in NFL history. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you an extra dimension kind of to the game. You, you mentioned that the circus was played in that venue right before the NFL championship mm-hmm. game. And that's, that's just an added dimension to it that, um, and, and an added sensory experience that, that you can tap into. But it, yeah, it just makes the stories richer or like you can find it. Like it just makes the stories richer in, the, in learning the history, you know, much richer if you can find those type of quotes and, and people talking about it. And your oral history book is called old leather. Yeah. It's a uh, old leather, uh, an oral history of early pro football in Ohio. Uh, when the NFL started from 1920 to 1935. So, and um, who who were you able to interview for that? And and what what did you find yeah, there, out? Yeah, I mean, because there wasn't as, as many people living, so I was able to track down uh, a couple of players who were living who played on NFL teams in Ohio. Uh, one was Glenn Presnell, uh, who was living in Ironton, Ohio at the time. I was, I was able to interview him before writing a book, and there was uh, another player who's living uh, named Nora Steverson, who was uh, living in Arizona. He was actually the first player or first college player from Arizona state to play in the NFL. And he played for the uh, Cincinnati Reds uh, football team, you know, when they played in the NFL, you know, very briefly. And he only played a handful of games, but, but he was still living. So, so I, so I went out to Phoenix and interviewed him about his experience. So those were the remaining players. Uh, I was able to find archival interviews with Fritz Pollard who played for the Akron pros so the, those were some of the players that I was able to find and, and use. So, yeah, wow, that's great. A, a Fritz Pollard interview, you, you know, you, I wouldn't even know that existed. Yeah, we we uh, NFL Films interviewed him in 1976, so we had that, uh, and then I believe there was an interview um, which I found later was uh, that was done because he went to Brown University. They did an oral history interview with him. Um, in the seventies too. Uh, and that was there. So, uh, like I said, you're just happy to be able to find some of these things like that, uh, that some people do that you just sometimes just finding it is a uh, key. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try to dig through as much as you can, or, you know, like I said, the, you know, stuff that's online now is very great because you usually had to go to the library, but now you can search online and see if the archives have it vaulted correctly, you know, or stored in their library correctly. So you can be able to find it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the great things about the internet. You can find, you know, sometimes on on university websites, you know, an oral history interview like you did apparently with Brown. You know, I think one of the things that that really stands out to me about about your oral history work, you know, is pro football originated in Ohio. That was one of the birthplaces of pro football. So, it's really important to preserve that history, I think. That was my first book, so you know, um, so I really wanted to do that. Like, like I mentioned earlier, you know, three of my favorite books are oral history, so it's kind of like a, 
you know, paying homage to, to those earlier books, you know, uh, and like, you're, you're right. That's how I sort of gave it a little bit of a hook in that I just focused on Ohio teams, early enough Ohio teams, because in 1920, when the league got founded in Canton, actually, and that's one of the first chapters is an oral history interview with Lester Higgins, who was Ralph Hayes' brother-in-law, and, and that interview was done in the 70s. And he was actually there at the meeting with Ralph Hayes and Jim Thorpe when they, and George Hallis when they formed him. You know, so that sort of starts the book, because in 1920, the best teams were in Ohio. You know, you had Canton, you had Akron, you know, Columbus was still playing, Dayton was playing. Um, and then as the game got a little more popular and grew and, and sort of went to the bigger cities, by 1935, there was no NFL Ohio team, which was very strange. <laughs> and that's why the book goes from 1920. Like it starts out with all these teams and these players, and you learn about those teams. But then by 1935, it was there was no team in Ohio. So you know, until 1937, when the Cleveland Rams came into the league. So, so that's the sort of beginning, uh, beginning, middle, end of the oral history is. is from 20 to 35. So that's like you mentioned, that history is, is important, you know, because of the, the state sort of grew the game, made the game popular, uh, the best players played in Ohio, you know, and then all of a sudden when the league and the sport got a little bit more organized, now it was ready to grow. And, and, and you know, so Ohio sort of added a different viewpoint in time, you know, in 1935. Wow. And that's really interesting. I'd never really realized that in 1935, there were no pro teams, NFL teams, at least in Ohio, which is kind of hard to imagine. But then, like you said, the Rams started in 37 and then the Browns started a few years later. They came in in 1946. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it was strange. Cause like, like you mentioned, because they, they dominated the sport so much, even up to when the league was founded, you know, and then when the league was founded, they still had those teams and and then, like I said, it's just the way the, the league grew and became a little more popular, and they moved to the bigger cities. Um, so teams like, you know, Canton and, and Akron and Dayton, you know, wasn't big enough, or let alone like the Oorang Indians from Rue, <laughs> a town of, you know, 700. Uh, those teams sort of faded, and the bigger city teams took over. So it's definitely an interesting time, you know, in NFL history. Yeah, and it definitely makes the Packers story kind of, even that more interesting that they were able to stay in Green Bay. Absolutely. I mean, that's the one small town team that survived, you know, you know, the, the other two original teams were both based in Chicago. So they were big city. So, uh, so for Green Bay to survive a hundred years now as a town team and really, you know, still operating that way, you know, like I said, yeah, that's, that, you can't even make that up. That sounds like a Hollywood thing. You know, you made it up and, you know, we, we, nope, it's still there and they're a town team and uh, it's operated that way. So, so Green Bay is definitely unique in that way. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, of course the Bears moved from Decatur and the um, Lions moved from Portsmouth, you know, but the Packers somehow got to stay. So finishing up with Bronco Nogurski and people can get the book pretty much anywhere, I'm guessing. Yeah, the publisher is Rowan and Littlefield. So if you go on Rowan.com, that's R O W M A N.com, you can find it. And there's like, you know, reviews and spe- uh, special little things about the book on there. Uh, but you can also get it on Amazon. Uh, there might be a discount on Amazon too, uh, and then Barnes and Noble. So, um, but Rowan, Rowan website will give you a little more, you know, uh, information and, and reviews and things like that uh, on the website. And for people to know, about Bronco Nagurski, what do, what do you think is the most important fact for people to know about Bronco? I mean, the title of the book, I say he's the, the greatest two-way fullback of all time, and I, I think that's pretty accurate. He played the fullback position, you know, probably better than anybody during that, that first 25 years of pretty much two-way football. You know, so that his, that's his on-the-field sort of legacy, I think, you know, is maybe being maybe the greatest at his position, uh, but off the field was sort of a uh, sort of shy, you know, family oriented sort of, you know, a lot of that came in, in some of the stories in the book is his, you know, just dedication to his family. Uh, I mean, he didn't leave International Falls, Minnesota, which is in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in northern Minnesota. Like he didn't stay in Chicago. He didn't, you know, move to L.A. or, you know, or go to a different city like he stayed in his hometown. Uh, and that should tell you a lot about him, you know, uh, as a person, just, you know, dedicated to his family and his hometown. 
So, you know, that sort of both on and off the field sort of legacy of being, you know, great player and great guy. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Game Before the Money podcast. Be sure to visit thegamebeforethemoney.com. Thegamebeforethemoney.com features great football history articles. Transcriptions of some podcast episodes can also be found at thegamebeforethemoney.com and are powered by our transcription partner, Sonics. Spelled S-O-N-I-X. Visit sonics.ai to learn more about their transcription services. Yeah. Yeah.